23 years ago, I had to come here to Hardy Street and have a test. I wanted to buy my first house. To get life insurance against the property, it required a blood test. But a new disease had just hit the world. And I was in this high-risk group of gay men. If I had that infection in my blood, I knew I was going to die, and die in one of the most unpleasant ways imaginable, wasting away until I ended up looking like a victim in a concentration camp. My HIV test came back negative, but others were not so lucky. To date, around the world, 65 million others. So why here in Britain in 2007 does HIV AIDS rarely make the headlines? It's almost got to the stage now where people don't worry about HIV anymore. Do we know who's being infected today? I mean, this is what HIV looks like. It's just the granny sitting next to you on the train. Do we still contract it in the same way? What is it, Carla? What is it? Because you've got AIDS. Is risky behaviour on the rise again? There are people out there that really get off on dangerous sex. I've been told I might discover some uncomfortable truths. Even if they've got those four or five wives, still they go out to look for more. What I do know is that there are now three times as many people with HIV in Britain as there were ten years ago. In 50 minutes you'll be able to tell me whether I'm HIV positive. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That is extraordinary. Yeah. And you can still see the destructive force of AIDS in Britain today. But you don't really expect to see Christmas this year? No. It's here as much as it ever was. I want to know exactly what AIDS means here in the first decade of the 21st century in Britain and around the world. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. 20 years ago, the message about AIDS was simple. We were told there was no cure, no treatment, and the fear was millions would die. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. The huge government publicity campaign targeted everyone in Britain, but the two main groups contracting HIV in the 1980s were homosexual men, like me, and intravenous drug users. Now HIV seems to have changed. It's a disease that can affect all of us. Heterosexual sex has overtaken homosexual sex as the most common route of transmission amongst new cases. And those new cases are rising fast. 70,000 people are now infected with HIV in Britain. The problem is that until someone knows they're infected, they're completely unaware of how close they can be to HIV. Chris Lee in Edinburgh had been living with a girlfriend for two years. So how did he find out that he had HIV? I came in from work one night and found my girlfriend crying, which was unusual in itself. I went through all the kind of options. I thought, is it your mother, is it your dad, is it your sister, is it your, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I just made a real flippant remark, well, you got AIDS or something, you know, like, and she lifted her head and was like, I youth. And I said, what, you got the virus? And she just nodded and, and that was that. Crikey. How long had you been together? About two years. And had she been infected all that time? Yeah. And known it? Yeah. So she kept it from you? Mm. When I found out, I sat in the same spot, I think, for the whole weekend. I don't think I even went to the toilet. I think I sat there for just numb. Presumably you were thinking the worst. A, I was going to die young. Yeah. I wasn't going to have any kids. You know, I couldn't play football anymore. You know, what, what could I do? Everything I wanted to do, I probably couldn't do. Yeah. The fact that she didn't tell you is, is damning, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. a terrible thing to live with someone for two years, knowing that you could be infecting them and not telling you. For her to do that, it was the single worst thing that I couldn't think of, the worst thing you could have done to me. Did she get ill? But a year and a half after I was diagnosed, she died. It's horrible to say, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't shed a tear to be fair. And that would be around the time that I said, right, OK, that's, that's my monkey off my back, I can get on with it now. Explained a lot of things that I already wondered about them. All of that was eight years ago. 
Chris has survived thanks to drugs, but as a result of his HIV, he's had severe shingles, cancer and chemotherapy. But he's continued to work and to date women. Unlike the partner who infected him, Chris immediately tells any new girlfriend about his HIV. With Sarah, that happened just six weeks ago. Yeah, I think I actually was winded. Yeah, yeah. He told me. Um, but I didn't feel like crying or anything. I just felt shocked and saddened and yeah. everything. What was your idea, if you had one, of a typical HIV-positive person before Chris told you? Gay, predominantly gay. Yeah. Um, I don't know the facts and figures, but if you asked me, I'd probably say there was more gay HIV than straight, but that's probably totally wrong. Yeah. Sarah probably speaks for most of Britain when she equates HIV with gay people. Think HIV, think gay still seems to be the lasting impact of the public health campaign of the late 80s. To be fair, all the people I ever knew with AIDS at that time, and through most of the 90s, were, like me, gay. I visited many of them here in this hospital, the Middlesex, now closed, in central London. Friends lying in beds, dying. And there'd be little clusters of parents sitting on their child's bed, looking at them and stroking their hair, and the way they found out that their sons were gay was being told that they were also under sentence of death from AIDS. And often the partner was sitting with the parents. And the parents are looking at the partner, and you know they're thinking, did, he, did he, you give it to my boy? And why aren't you ill? Why aren't you the one who's dying? Every one of the people I came to visit is now dead. But I remember that gradually shock and sadness weren't the only emotions I felt. There were some friends uh, where I would come to visit them, and in my gut, I was still very angry with them. I still couldn't believe they could have caught this stupid virus. Because there were some, I know, who had carried on with high-risk activity. And I just thought that was so fantastically stupid. I couldn't understand why anybody would do something so dangerous. It wasn't as if people weren't aware of how you contracted HIV. They knew it wasn't from lavatory seats or sharing cups or kissing. You had to exchange body fluids, blood or semen, by sharing needles if you were a drug addict or having sex without a condom. And then in 1992, it happened to one of my closest friends, the man who was my first real partner in love from my years at Cambridge. We had split up and moved apart, but we were still close friends when Kim told me that both he and his new partner, Alistair, were positive. Um, that's right, the eyes go, is the, um, going from light to dark. Right. Because um, it's either hugely glary or... It's right now. OK. <laughs> Kim has been left nearly blind by HIV, but Alistair, his partner, died. I remember a week after our diagnosis, and we were walking around town to see the Middlesex Hospital, and he said to me, I'm going to die there soon. And I was just so... Inwardly, you know, and my heart collapsed like a heap of sand. But outwardly, I was very bullish. Nonsense, you know, yeah. conchy talk. What are you talking about? The drugs just around the corner. But he closed down. Two years after the diagnosis, he was hospitalised for the first time. Yeah. And thereafter, he aged 50 years in as many weeks. It was nightmare. Of all the ways to leave the party, it's one of the most agonising and attritional. Oh, that's a nice one of you, Alistair, with cat. Alistair died before the drugs were discovered that have helped Kim to control the effects of his HIV. I found it very upsetting to watch Alistair's body literally being overwhelmed by the infection, but I also felt disappointed and quite angry. When I first heard the, the diagnosis, part, uh, of course I was so distressed, but I was also very cross with you. You know, I thought, oh, hell, come on, Kim, you knew better than most what the dangers were. Surely you can't have been so... Silly as to do this to yourself. It's not a need to punish. It's just even. no, it's, not yeah. at all. Yeah. It's just oh, what well, you know? If only yeah. you know, steps had been taken to avoid it. Mm. This is Alistair's memorial. Mm -hmm. 
1962 to 1996. I mean, that is... Not a life, is it? It really isn't. 34 years old. I'm such a good-looking boy. And he's so young. And... For years, I was going to a memorial service at least once a month. Knowing the behaviour that puts you at risk should save you. Then again, as you can clearly see, despite all the warnings, I still smoke. So I'm not being critical, just regretful that warnings weren't heeded. But one death brought AIDS closer to the general population at the start of the 1990s more than any other. The music world has been paying tribute to Freddie Mercury, the lead singer with the rock group Queen. He died last night just 24 hours after saying he had AIDS. The head of an AIDS trust said Freddie's death would affect schoolchildren more than any publicity could do. It would be a sign that AIDS is a real illness and affects real people. And for a time, it worked. The statistics for HIV infection from gay sex went down. But what about the gay scene today? Do young gays who don't carry with them the horrific AIDS images behave recklessly? I've come to meet a man I last saw as a fellow pupil at prep school and who's now the leading HIV consultant in the northwest of England. Working in a hospital in Manchester, a large proportion of Ed's patients are gay. He allowed me to sit in on an HIV test on one of them. Do you have a regular partner? I don't know. Um, during this time, have there been you know, episodes of unsafe sex? Yes. Right. When was the most recent one of those? Um, actually was three weeks ago. We have a routine where patients who request an HIV antibody test do actually go and see a counsellor to go through the test procedure in detail, what it means, what a positive or negative test may mean. I've got young Gordon here. Can you identify any recent risk? Um, yes. Um, I, you know, I, I went through a very big spell of having maybe four, different fi four or five men a week and to going to nothing for a year and a half. In the last, last year and a half, I have slept with maybe two people, three people, and the the last one was three weeks ago. And you know, you go so long without having sex, and then three weeks ago you have sex, and we didn't use a condom. Are you saying that on that occasion, the person you were with didn't want to use a condom? We both didn't. What difference do you think it would make to your life if you were positive? Not for one second of my life would I want the disease, but I'm not going to sit and worry about things. But if your test was positive today, you would be the person who was living with that. Exactly. Yeah, no, I'm sure you're right. But it's not going to be positive, so it's OK. I like positive thinking. <laughs> While we left an apparently confident Gordon at the hospital, Ed took me to the lab where Gordon's blood will be tested. Now, this is only the Manchester lab, but it carries out 25,000 HIV tests a year. Around 500 are positive, 500 lives altered forever. The question, of course, is whether Gordon is going to be another. I think he's rather brave to allow me to witness what could be a life-changing moment, and I have to tell you that none of us at this stage knows what the outcome will be. While we're waiting for uh, the machine to produce Gordon's results, I can't help admitting that I'm slightly disappointed in my people, if I want to put it that way, for the fact that they seem to have slipped back so in terms of the, just looking after their own health in such a simple way. It is the million dollar question, why are we still seeing an increase in gay men where the education and message mm. has been there for a long time? And uh, in gay bars there are always free condoms. And absolutely, there's... it's always available. I still find it difficult to understand why people put themselves at so much risk and some of the, the saunas and the bathhouses, yes, people are putting themselves at, at excessive risk with anonymous sex. Well, the most extreme example that a patient has told me, uh, he did tell me that over a weekend uh, he had uh, 200 uh, persons, sexual contacts, in an anonymous sex type sauna. The latest infection statistics reveal that 2,000 men contracted HIV last year from gay sex, almost double the figure of 10 years ago. When you get the results for one of your patients and you call him or her in and you sit with them and 
you tell them. That must be a very difficult thing as a doctor to, to do. It's a very difficult piece of information to give to someone, whatever the situation is. It is always the same message that can never be taken back. Yeah. Hello. Hi again, Gordon. Hi there. Gordon, your result is negative. Fabulous. Right. Thank you very much. As far as it goes. As far as it goes, and I will be back in, um, what was what it you said? Nine weeks. Nine weeks, ten weeks time, and I will come and we'll do it again, and then we'll know for sure. And then we'll know for sure, because and I'm going then to be a good boy between now and then. Result. You've got to be a good boy between well, now and then. I've got to be a good boy for the rest of my life but particularly in the next 10 weeks so we know what's going on. The rest of the time. I know, I don't really want to... Understand. It's only taken an hour for Gordon to know that his moment of unsafe sex hasn't harmed him, but to be absolutely sure, he has to have another test in three months. That's because it takes three months from infection for antibodies to show in the blood. But rapid tests have proved themselves almost 100% accurate as indicators, so Gordon can relax. Gordon is also honest about what helped put him at risk, and he's not alone. A recent survey told me that two out of five young people, gay and straight in Britain, didn't use a condom with a new partner because they were drunk. So you come to a moment like when you had sex three weeks ago. You've already said you were drunk, but can you, can you just sort of reconstruct what, what went through your mind when it comes to the bit when you, you hit the bedroom or whatever part of the well, house? It wasn't you were... even the hit in the bedroom part. It was... Um, we were getting jiggy, as it were, mm. and we talked about me penetrating him. Yeah. And I said, in fact, did we even discuss condoms? Do you know, I can't remember three no. weeks ago if we did or not. But in the past, the only time it's discussed is that split second before you do it. I can probably count the time I've done, used a condom in my life on one hand. Really? Yes. You know, when you when you meet someone and you're going to have sex, do you, do you say, have you been tested? Are you positive? No? You never? No. Never have. Don't mean to say I never would. Yeah. I've never asked somebody beforehand, no. And, and have you been asked ever? No. Really? No. Never. Listening to Ed and Gordon leaves me wondering if in the gay community, safe sex is the exception, not the rule. To get a broader impression, I asked Gordon to take me to Canal Street in the heart of Manchester's gay village. And do you actually ask them their status? No, it's not like it's something you ask people. Yeah. It's, um, well, by the look of them, really. And when you meet someone, do you do you ask their status? I think it's important to. I'm not sure. I'm not necessarily saying that it always happens. Syphilis is rife in Manchester. Now, there's no reason why HIV couldn't get to exactly the same stage based upon that, because people are ignorant towards safe sex. Two of my friends have just re recently been diagnosed with HIV. Really? So, actually finding out was, was a shock. Yeah. And it's just, it's made me realise that life is precious. But your status is negative. negative. Yeah. Do you generally find that the atmosphere in, the, in, in what is pretty reckless, or are most people like you? I think there's a bit of both. Yeah. I do meet people who um, do come across as reckless, really. I think there's still reckless elements out there. Yeah. There's a lot of people who don't care. I find that all rather depressing, but little do I know that Gordon has saved the most worrying for last. He's known Mark for years and assures me that what I'm about to hear is true. I've got a friend, uh, he's been to a party in Nottingham. Uh, where there was a 19-year-old lad, he was negative, and he wanted to be given the gift. The gift? They're called gift givers, people with HIV. Good girl. And there were five positive guys who had sex with the negative lad to pos him up, and... Um, pos him up? Yeah. They all had sex with him unprotected to give him the gift. He wasn't held down, he wasn't forced, he willingly... So your friend was one of these five who... One of the five people. Who, who showed him? Yeah. And can you have any insight into why he wanted to? He thought it was a badge of honour, or I have no idea, to be honest. I mean, a lot of lads these days, a lot of lads like unprotected sex. Yeah, but of course, you know what happened at the end. What? Yeah, um, when they finished having sex with him, they inserted a butt plug into him to make sure that none of the semen came out of him to make sure that he definitely My get God. every positive part. Really? That's, I'm 
sorry, that is very odd. It is. <laughs> Just... It's horrible. <laughs> Thank you, as well. It horrifies me to know that 25 years on, there are actually people in Britain who want to be infected. Maybe young gay men behave as they do because they've not seen the face of AIDS the way I did. I saw it again for the first time in many years when after Manchester I went to a hospice on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Ah, Willie. Hi, I'm Stephen. It's nice to meet you. Hello. Willie Henderson is only 42, but after years of combating his HIV with drugs, he's now in the final stages of AIDS. So how old were you when you were diagnosed? Uh, but 19. 18, so you were 19, a yeah. teenager? Aye. Yeah. And I suppose you'd had a, uh, a sexually active life as a... Oh, aye. Yeah. It was a very... <laughs> you enjoyed yourself? <laughs> oh, at the time, we still believed at points it wasn't sexually... Transmitted? Aye. But then when more and more people were catching it, that's when we went, no, we'll hate to curtail it. Yeah. And that, that's when we did start using condoms and that, so... But for you, it was shutting the stable door after the horse had Aye. gone. <laughs> and now there's generations of young gay people who are almost behaving in the same way as mm. you. Almost behaving Aye, as if... In yeah. the 70s. Yeah. 80s, and they're going out to look for sex, and they're doing it. Mm. With no condoms, no protection. In some ways, you can be quite a good warning to those young people because mm -hmm. you are a little like the face of AIDS of the 1980s. A, a, a gay man who's slipping away from Aye. what used to be called full-blown AIDS. And, and you have that look, you know, I'm sure you don't mind me saying it. Although you look after yourself nicely and you've Aye. got nail varnish on and mm -hmm. things, you, you're pretty emaciated, aren't you? I meant no hurt to Willie describing him like that, but seeing him as he is is shocking. It's been a long time since I've seen someone with what used to be called full-blown AIDS. It's a kind of lesson, it's a sort of warning for us all, isn't it? Uh, but it's not that uncommon. I mean, Willie's the fourth person that we've supported in the last two years who is at that stage of complete full-blown AIDS. It's not gone away. It's here as much as it ever was. The way I feel with my system, I get odd feelings in my guts and that. And my legs are now quite bad. Yeah. And that I'm on quite a big amount of painkillers. You don't really expect to see Christmas this year? No. After meeting him, I can't really believe that some 19-year-old would think it's a gift to have what infected Willie. Willie died just three weeks after I met him. So what about reckless behaviour in the heterosexual world? Well, this is what they call the strip in Doncaster on a Saturday night. Wild, I think, is the term. Now, we know there's a lot of unprotected sex in Britain today. That's why Britain is the teenage pregnancy capital of Europe. It's why sexually transmitted infections like syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydia are at epidemic levels, 60 to 70 percent higher than 10 years ago. And that's the very time that the boys and girls of Doncaster got a sharp reminder of the dangers of unprotected sex in their Sunday newspapers. Plastered over the front page was a picture of Steve Robson, bouncer at a local club. He'd just been diagnosed as HIV positive. The problem was that for the past year, he said he'd had sex with a different woman each night without a condom. The reaction of Doncaster's women soon showed that he wasn't exaggerating. We had about 800 calls in all. Uh, and, and I don't know the exact figure, but I think hundreds of women were tested. And they were specifically but, linked to this man? Well, it, it all started off with this man, but it depends what sort of uh, nightlife and whether you're sexually active, because, like, anybody who slept with this man, if they slept with a, somebody else a week, week or two after... Yeah. Age yeah. Romeo dies at 41. It was about a year after the story broke, wasn't it? Mm. Um, he died in hospital after becoming so weak he could barely walk. 
Um, did did any of the women he infected die? I, I can remember one who did. She died before the man who infected her did. Four other women were also infected. Yes, I can understand why you're worried. The public health department in Doncaster believed even more women were infected, but were just too frightened to come forward to be tested. They called it an outbreak and pinpointed the cause. There are only two things most lads in Doncaster won't wear. The first is a raincoat, and the second, it seems, is a condom. It says here, Doncaster's faithful <laughs> leapt to its defence and said it's worse in Barnsley, <laughs> which yeah. is hardly a defence. Judging by the streets of Doncaster this Saturday night, the party goes on. So could it happen again? The obvious answer is to talk to people in the pubs and clubs, but now somehow doesn't seem the right moment. Better to wait till Monday. Ah, that's better. Monday nights is a quieter night than most nights. Right. Prepare me for this um, moment when I offer someone a condom. What's the response usually? Women say I've joined Robert and Sue on their condom patrol. As part of their work in the local HIV centre, they give out advice and condoms in the pubs and clubs of Doncaster. But if you just met someone and you, you fell into bed in the way people do, would you ask him to wear a condom if you didn't definitely, know? Definitely, yeah. Oh, you would? Oh, yeah. Even um, if you know him, I think you're still you're not going to tell you everything, are they? I mean, I want. Who were the kind of people who would you think were at risk? Everyone, aren't they? Everyone at risk. Oh, so you do think that everyone yeah. is at risk? Yeah. yeah. And if you were to have an encounter of some kind, does a girl ever say, oh, wear a condom, or would you naturally carry condoms with you? No. no. You never do? <laughs> no. Do you insist on boys you meet if you're going to have an encounter that they wear a condom? Yes. You do? Yes. That's very good. And, and do you usually find that they're okay with that? No. no. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah, isn't no. it? So they, they kind of go, oh, do I have to? We don't like condoms at all. It's just like nowadays, the lads just want a one night stand, don't they? Yeah. That's what a lot of them want. Would you carry condoms? Are you I've happy actually, with that? I've actually got some in my bag. Oh, go on, let's have a look. <laughs> oh, you are a model citizen. You're sensible about it, but we're you're not. We're not, we're naughty. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're not, you're not pompous about it. You're not. Naughty, really? Yeah, but that's what, it's fine to be naughty. But not, in, not dangerous. Looking at what I'm assured is the typical Saturday night crowd, it's hard to judge what is naughty or dangerous. But is it just the behaviour of sexually promiscuous young people that we need to worry about? I've come further north to Cumbria to meet Kate Jacobs. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me describing her as a more mature lady. She became HIV positive when she was just 32, when for the one and only time, a condom burst. Her partner died not long after of AIDS, and Kate was left in her mid-thirties to forge a new life. Her experiences with the new men that came into that life shocked her. I only ever had a one encounter with somebody who already had a condom on them. Just one person. Straight men. You straight them. men. Yeah. Straight men. Also, I became aware quite quickly that there, um, there are people out there that really get off on dangerous sex. And um, there was a sense, I suppose, almost of Russian roulette. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> to put too fine a point in it, I'd become the most dangerous ride on the fairground and therefore the most attractive. And there was, and I'm not saying there were many, but there was de a significant number of people for whom that was a, th a bit of a thrill. You could see that it was a bit of a kick. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. And, there, and people who, uh, along the line, didn't want to use condoms. And I was also surprised, even knowing my status, the number of them who still didn't want to use one. The most lame excuse in the world being that it feels better without. Well, I can tell you something for sure and for certain. It feels a damn sight better making love without um, HIV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listening to Kate's experience bears out the worst recent HIV statistics. In 10 years, heterosexual infection has risen in Britain by 400%. It now accounts for half of all new infections, but looking through the statistics throws up another uncomfortable fact. Increasingly, they show the impact AIDS in Africa is leaving in this country. This is Gainsborough, 
small market town in Lincolnshire. Hey, I'm Stephen. This must be Jay. Hello, how nice to meet you. Lizzie Jordan met her partner Benji when she was at university. He was in his 30s and had come to Britain from Ghana. They lived together for four years. A year after Jay, their daughter, was born early in 2006, Benji suddenly felt ill. He didn't go to the doctor the whole time that we were together and he, he looked like an athlete. He went to the gym every week, he had perfect physique. He started having headaches and um, complaining of pains in his cheeks, which the GP put down to having some sort of sinus infection and he was given antibiotics. Um, and then two, three days after taking them, he started vomiting and he was, his speech was becoming a bit erratic. So we spoke to NHS Direct and they said they thought really, because he was lapsing into national consciousness by then, he should go to hospital. They went and did the scan, um, came back saying they thought he had a stroke and that they could see pockets of something in his brain, but they couldn't tell what it was and his brain was very um, enlarged. So that was Wednesday, Wednesday morning yeah. and they, uh, they said, you know, they hoped that they were going to operate on Friday, but they knew it was going to be post-mortem, but they would find out what had killed him. Oh, my goodness. So that was... And they told you that? Yeah. So they just told you to prepare for him to die? Yeah, and they said it would be hours, not, not days. So and were they was, right? Yeah. That was... Um, sorry, that oh, no, was, you uh, poor thing, of course. That was, uh, like, lunch type, sorry. No, how old was he? 33. 33 years old. So sudden. <laughs> The hospital sent Benji's brain for post-mortem examination. It took five months for the results to come back. Lizzie was horrified to learn Benji had died of a brain disease related to AIDS. Three weeks later, she discovered she too was HIV positive. For the last six months, she's feared that daughter Jay would be too. The day before I met her, the final test results came through with the news that Jay was not positive. But Lizzie's relief about Jay is tempered by the realisation that she just didn't think about protecting herself. She knows Benji was unaware of his condition, but she feels now that it's important for couples to test at the start of their relationship. Everyone has a sexual past. It's not racist to think that if that past was in Africa, it could have left its mark. For example, in Zimbabwe or South Africa, between 20 and 30 percent of the population are infected with HIV. The most recent UK infection statistics confirm the global village we now live in. A third of the total diagnosed in Britain last year were black Africans, most of whom were immigrants to this country. Hilda Pachawo came to Britain from Zimbabwe. She was infected by her husband. He wasn't faithful at all. That's what I discovered after a long journey with him. And if you tell him that, look, we both have to go and be checked, he would just brush it off as if it's something not really s serious to think about. And you knew it must be him because you were a faithful wife? Yes, I knew it was him. Yeah. Definitely. One of the questions that arises all the time, which is a very delicate one, a very sensitive one, is why the epidemic is so severe in sub-Saharan Africa. Maybe 10 years ago, there was the same prevalence in Southeast Asia, but they've never developed anything like the percentages of prevalence that we have in Africa. Some people suggest that it is simply a cultural difference, that the men in that part of Africa are culturally less likely to be able to modify their behaviour. I know you're pretty angry about your husband, <laughs> but I wondered if he was a typical Zimbabwean male. Most of them are very promiscuous, yeah. and they don't just stick to one partner. Most of them have still got this theory of poly uh, polygamism. Yes. So they have four or five wives, and even if they've got those four or five wives, still they go out to look for more. Most of them, even if they do know that they are positive, they don't have the audacity of saying, I cannot sleep with you without a condom. That's the way they term sex as well, that why should I use a condom when I can go the whole way without using a condom, so most... Because a wife is, is property. 
Yes, because a wife to them is termed as a property and you cannot say no to your husband. You cannot say we need to use a condom. Hilda feels very strongly about her experience. She now lives in Birmingham, but today she's travelled to speak to this congregation in South London. It would be better for you yourself to go and have the test done before you even get married or before you get into whatever you want to get into because it's your life and your health that you're protecting. I would encourage everybody who's getting married that first go and get tested because not everybody is truthful. Not everybody is open enough to say that they are positive. I wanted to confirm that Hilda's warnings weren't just influenced by her own distressing experience. As it happens, James Chin, an eminent epidemiologist and at one time in charge of global HIV surveillance for the World Health Organization, was giving a lecture in London on this very subject. Some of the studies carried out by WHO in the late 1980s showed that anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the uh, adult adolescent population uh, had multiple and concurrent sex partners on a routine basis sometimes daily, but at least weekly or monthly, sex partner exchange. And one of the myths about AIDS is that it's poverty, where if you look at the wealthiest 20% of the population, compare it to the poorest 20% of the population, you see HIV infection rates are two to three times higher in the wealthiest population compared to the poorest. And the reason for this is that in general, the wealthier persons tend to have more sexual partners. Pure and simple. Now, this is obviously a controversial point of view, so I asked James about the research that underpins it. And of course, we hit a real problem here, which can be called political correctness, which is, oh, I tell you why you've got so much AIDS, it's not actually your poverty. It's the way your particularly male population behave. To it's him, male and female. Male and female. Oh, yes. oh right. You, do, you don't see a, a distinction there. That's interesting. Yeah. By talking to the women in rural areas and in urban areas, that yeah. they, they are aware that their male partners go out and have multiple sex partners, and they say, you know, what's good, good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah. In the early days, WHO <clears throat> carried out studies that showed 20 to 40 percent of Africans, male and female, have premarital and extramarital uh, relationships. It's those numbers, multiple and concurrent, that drives an epidemic. So the kind of sex, say, in the UK, where boy and girl have sex, they may go steady for six months, they break up, and then they form That's another. That's to have a new partner. Exactly. It's and the concurrency of different partners at the same time. So you need that type of pattern. Both James and Hilda clearly connect the huge rise in HIV infection rates in Africa with people's choice of personal behavior. I know how provocative that sounds, and obviously it has to be followed up. The place to do so is equally obvious. South Africa is the country with by far the highest level of HIV infection in the world, almost 20% of the adult population. Five and a half million people already, and half a million more newly infected each year. So, with such a scale of infection here, does the government blame the people? Is there a massive public health campaign to warn of the dangers of HIV and the consequence of AIDS? In the past, the answer was no. When President Nelson Mandela never mentioned AIDS, and the current government, led by Thabo Mbeki, argues there's no proof HIV causes AIDS. His health minister advocates eating beetroot as a treatment for the disease. I want to know if, in the face of the terrible statistics, the government has a new public message about HIV. Over the hill in Cape Town from the poor townships is where the man I want to see lives. Edwin Cameron is gay, openly positive for 20 years, and despite that, a chief justice in South Africa. He's also an open critic of President Mbeki, and he told me about an incident just the day before we met that seemed to sum up the government's attitude. 
the question to him and the health minister was whether they were prepared in public to have a test to encourage other people to do so and they both said no. And one of the doctors, a very fine doctor who heads the HIV Clinician Society said well they both had high blood pressure tests, why don't they have HIV tests in public? And for the minister to say that she won't have the test uh, sets back prevention efforts, it sets back uh, education, it sets back the normalization of this epidemic because the emphasis on tests is because it's estimated 90 percent of people with hiv here don't know they've got it and continue to infect others it does seem there is still reluctance at the top in south africa to accept the most basic point that aids starts with hiv it's a continuing crisis in leadership and the underlying problem seems still to be that our president still has reservations about the viral etiology of this disease. Our president seemed to be offended by the idea that the medical view on AIDS was because it's a, a, a sexually transmitted illness. Therefore, he saw the traditional view as being some sort of slight on African sexual behaviour, which it was Edwin then told me a really horrifying statistic that the government's own AIDS division put out just two weeks before. Last year in South Africa, 346,000 people died of AIDS. Now we're talking here on a magnificent morning in Cape Town. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful morning and it, it cannot but be anguishing to think that a thousand people today, you can work it out in minutes while we're sitting and talking. It's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. It's an appalling figure. There are 90 percent of those who die could be saved if they had access to the drugs that keep Edwin alive. But in South Africa, only 200,000 do. And that's not because the government can't afford the drugs. They can. It's just that they don't believe they work because they don't believe HIV leads to AIDS. I find it hard to believe the government can still think like that. I asked the Director General of Health if he did. Each time you talk to the media about why HIV and AIDS is where it is, if time you talk to anybody about it, yeah. it is traced back to that one statement. Yeah. An incredibly dangerous thing to say because it, it went against the entire medical establishment of the world. It went against orthodox. It, and, and, it was, yeah, and, and, and that's a very... Sinful, the most sinful thing you can do in any kind of... A, situation is to be unorthodox. When a thousand people a day are dying... But, but, yes. but precisely, when, when you're asking the right questions about why a thousand people in South Africa are dying, yeah. why a thousand people in Africa are dying, and not in the UK. Yes, you look to see the difference, and the yeah, difference is, and in the UK, no one has questioned the link no, no, between no, no, HIV no, and AIDS. No, yes, but it's in, the outcome that matters. Being, being, wrong being, wrong on, oh, being wrong on the connection okay, between HIV and this, AIDS... Then I can say this and thing. that's the government line. It's clear to me that the people of South Africa are not helped in fighting HIV-AIDS by the absence of a strong public message of the kind we had in Britain. Lucky Mazibuko. Nice to know you. I, do, I knew it was you. Lucky Mazibuko is the best-known person with HIV in South Africa, thanks to the newspaper column he writes and the fact that for most of the 16 years he's been positive, he refused treatment. It was a public campaign by him to press the government into making drugs and treatment a priority. I thought we'd talk about the government's failings, but instead, Lucky wants to emphasize people's own responsibilities. I mean, in South Africa, 95% of the people are aware of what HIV is and how you get it. My own uh, thinking and my own experience is that uh, HIV is a personal issue uh, before it becomes a governmental issue. Yeah. If you go on a date, you don't call the president and tell them <laughs> you, yeah, you found a new girlfriend or you don't call the, uh, the minister of health and say, if should anything go wrong, I, you'll hear from me. Well, I think now that we have to get to a stage where we become uh, uh, aggressive in terms of our approach to this thing and perhaps uncompromising. You know that if you have sex without protection, you're likely to be infected, period. There's no two ways about it. Which is perhaps why my thinking and my philosophy now is to focus more on children Hello. because I see them as the best vehicle to take us to an AIDS-free world sooner, you know, uh, rather than later. Have you seen a condom? What do you use it for? For protecting yourself. Is it right? Yes. Yeah, what are the ways in which you can get HIV? 
if you sleep with someone, if you don't need the condom. Why do you think people are afraid of talking about HIV? Because they are scared. They think they must lose friends. Because they think they lose friends, eh? Can you get HIV by touching someone? No. 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 Do you think you can get HIV by sharing a bath with someone? No. 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 Do you think you can get HIV by sharing the same food from the same plate? No. No. I am leading the way to an ace free well, yeah? You sing it, sit it. I'm quite astonished at how knowledgeable these children are and how frankly they talk about HIV and AIDS. But will they remember the message about safe sex when they're teenagers and the hormones and testosterone kick in? Lucky thinks that's the only hope for South Africa. People need to take the responsibility for their own sex lives. I was impressed by Lucky's openness and honesty, and his message does offer a way forward in combating South Africa's shocking infection figures. But my journey has shown me risky, promiscuous sex is behind the surge in HIV infection everywhere and amongst all groups, gay men, heterosexuals and black Africans. It's a surge that's predicted to take total HIV in the world to 60 million in 2015, 50% higher than today. So HIV is not a problem that's getting better. It's one that's getting far worse. And yet we seem to be ignoring it. Is it that we in Britain just don't believe it will happen to us? You can't tell what HIV looks like. I mean, this is what HIV looks like. It's just the granny sitting next to you on the train. A rather posh white lady in her late 50s isn't quite what the pupils of this rather posh private school on the outskirts of London expect. Anne-Marie Byrne was almost 50 when she was infected by her second husband. He died within months of being diagnosed. Anne-Marie came back to England with her 11-year-old son to get treatment. If you've ever wondered what the reaction to you would be if you were unfortunate enough to contract HIV, just listen to Anne-Marie. I thought it would be different here. It hasn't always proved to be as different as I thought it was going to be. Because I speak out quite often, I had AIDS graffiti painted on my flat. My son was surrounded by some young people who jostled him and pushed him and said his mother was a diseased old cow. Younger generations living quite close to where we are um, has been rather bad. Uh, calling my mother names, calling her dirty, calling her very horrible names, HIV, or whatever it was. I've had graffiti outside our house. Uh, people have threatened to beat me up. Kids, kids aging from about nine, following their older brothers, peers, whoever, up to twenties, thirties. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's, it's not been too good. I expected Anne-Marie's situation to generate sympathy and support, not a reaction like that. She's one of the first people on this journey to bring home to me the genuine fear HIV sufferers have about the reaction they face from people who find out about their status. She's too frightened to allow us to show where she lives. She's scared about the reaction to being seen on this programme. I, mean, I do get afraid. I get afraid that something might happen to me or my children because of what I'm doing, because of what we're doing. Yeah. It is astonishing to me. It has been a genuine surprise. I thought I knew my own country and I had no idea how locked in and alone so many people who are HIV positive feel. It's a very lonely thing. Do you know that they did a Maury poll a couple of years ago that said 75% of people in the UK wouldn't give money to HIV, to charities? And there's this whole thing of, well, you've done something to deserve it. Yes, I've had sex. Have you? <laughs> My mother died last year and she was living in Australia. And I would love to have gone and spent the last few years of her life with her. But I wasn't allowed to live in Australia because of my HIV status. So my mother died and I'm still really, really sad about that. I should have been living close to her. My daughter lives in New Zealand. I can't go and live next to her either. There are many countries that people with living with HIV can't live in. It's to do with stigma. They think we're going to get off the plane and stop bonking people and pass it on. And that's not going to happen. It's so not going to happen. 
I'm really interested to know if you were shocked when Anne-Marie said that she was HIV positive. Presumably you didn't know when she came in, did you? I just, I don't know, I just kind of thought you'd be weak or tired <laughs> or, you know, have a skin... I don't know. I thought you'd be, like, quite bitter about everything. I'm not angry, but I am bitter about the way people with HIV are treated. How do you think you'd deal with being HIV positive if you didn't give these talks? Well, if I didn't give these talks, I'd, I really don't know, because they've made me feel that I'm doing something worthwhile and it's made me feel useful. I think I, I probably would have died. To be perfectly honest, I would have just curled up, closed the curtains and just said, OK, I'm going to die as well. Having met Anne-Marie, I know her life is clearly divided into before HIV and after HIV. After is a life of struggle made worse by what she sees as a cold and hostile attitude to a sick person. She thinks her future is bleak, not because the medicines don't work, they do, but because the reaction to her HIV seems so bitter. Clearly a powerful stigma surrounds HIV that's there no matter how you've become infected. So what's the reaction a young teenage girl experiences who was actually born with HIV? How old are you there? Ten. Ten. You are very small and slight, aren't you? Yeah, it shows all of my friends in year six and then... Oh my goodness. <coughs> and you're the same age as them? Then? Yeah. Oh my lord, you are, you look... You look four years younger, don't you? You don't look well at all, no. though, do you? You really don't. You poor thing. Looking back... Carly was repeatedly ill, off school, but it still wasn't until she was 11 that she was finally diagnosed with HIV. Yeah. How had she got it? That was the next question. Eventually, doctors tested Carly's mother and found out that she was positive too and had been from before Carly was born. Carly had probably been infected by her mother's blood at birth. Carly was left to come to terms both with her HIV and how she contracted it. I wondered how people reacted when she told them she was HIV. I fell in love with a boy at 14 and um, I decided to tell him. Mm. And I trusted him and I was together for seven months and, and I told him. And then, understandably, he did tell his mum. She got drunk one night and out the window on an estate. It's like a small estate with a lot of people that was out. And she screamed it at me. What did she scream? Um, what is it, Carla? What is it? Because you've got AIDS. I ran off crying. Tell me about some of the, the nasty things that happened to you when, when it got out. A girl uh, spray painted over the park about me. <laughs> a HIV rat and I'm AIDS up and diseased and dutter. Big black spray paint for about three months, solid. Every weekend, sometimes during nights, um, girls would ring me, ringing me, telling me how dirty I was. They would put lads on the phone, or they'd put me in phone boxes, ring this girl and give her abuse. She's got AIDS. You know that I've, I've slept with my dad and caught it. And these girls had never met me before in their life, ever. And I tried everything. I tried screaming at home. I tried shouting at home. And then eventually, I decided to try and make them understand. And then I did a blog on my website. And then quite a lot of them apologised. Really? Yeah. I have not had a phone call since. I don't know whether I'm more depressed by the cruelty of Carly's tormentors or impressed by her bravery in reacting so strongly to them. I've come to meet Carly at the hospital in Leicester that monitors her HIV. She began treatment extremely ill, but the drugs have boosted her immune system and she's transformed from the tiny, sick 11-year-old in the photographs. At the same time, the nurse who's helped her through this process never lets Carly forget she's a teenager with HIV. New boyfriend? Yep. How long? Yeah. How long have you had him? Not how long. <laughs> you bad girl. <laughs> she's she yeah. wicked, isn't she? <laughs> um, sorry. Nice. Amazing. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and he's, he's really supportive of the HIV mm, and everything. Definitely, you know. And he knows your diagnosis anyway, doesn't he? Yep. Yeah. Good. OK. Condoms? Yes. Always? Always. Yes. I love you. I love you too. Telling your new boyfriend you're HIV positive must be very hard. The reaction of Ben's pals has made it harder. They tell him she'll infect him. It's hard, ain't it? 
I don't know why you're always saying sorry. Because then there's loads of girls out there that you could just go out with and it won't be, you won't have to have everything that goes with it. Yeah, well, it's my choice to be with you, they're not like you. What do you mean, they're not like me? No one's like you. No one's got your personality. Ben's right about Carly. She's certainly a unique young woman. For months, I've been assured by all the charities and hospitals dealing with the thousands of HIV teenagers in Britain that not one of them is prepared to be seen and to be filmed. I'm told they fear the reaction of friends or the public if their faces are seen. Carly, on the other hand, felt she could not stay silent. When you made the decision to be open about your status, was it almost a kind of bloody-mindedness? You know, when I got educated about it, and then I learned the street slang about it, and I knew what, what was true, and then I'm hearing a load of lies, and I couldn't, I couldn't stay in the dark. What is the, the street slang about it? Well, I mean, what, what do people say it's about dirt, it? Yeah. It's dirt. It's a disease. You stay away from it. You, you just don't touch it. You don't go near it. No one asked for it, though, do they? No one asked for it. But maybe if I stood up and said, I don't care, maybe I could inspire someone else to be the same, just to give them a little bit of hope. Yeah. We must be here for a purpose. And part of that purpose for you at the moment is to try and change, change yeah. the way people think. Yeah. And, and all those people out there who are watching you, what would you want them to learn from your experience, how would you want it to change the way they, the way they think about HIV and the way they think about people with HIV? If they're going to be judgmental, I'd like them to just educate themselves first and learn what it's about before you start shunning people and understand. I mean, is it going to take them to catch it or a member of their family to catch it before they finally understand? It shouldn't... Why wait? I mean, why don't you just be acceptance and appreciative of other people trying to do so much and don't kick them in the teeth. If you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say anything. Because they're not worth listening to. So, uh, you are an incredible person. <laughs> you really are. I think you are just about the best and wisest person I've spoken to in this whole film, I have to say. And you're the, one of the youngest. Coming away from Carly, the other thought that crosses my mind is how lucky it is that she's able to tell her story. If Carly hadn't been diagnosed, she could well have died. Drugs treatment has quite literally saved her, as it has thousands of others infected in Britain. But here's another frightening statistic. Doctors think that between a third and a half of all those with HIV in Britain today don't get treatment. Why? because they haven't been diagnosed, because they haven't taken a test. Living with HIV is what I'm going to explore in the next programme. In 50 minutes, you'll be able to tell me whether I'm HIV positive. Yeah, it's a, yeah. That is extraordinary. It's I know talking about sex is difficult, after all, we're British, but a whole new generation has grown up who don't seem to be fully aware of the risks of HIV. Well. That's why we're launching G.I. Johnny online at bbc.co.uk forward slash health, where you can learn the facts, become a G.I. and help protect your friends. So, log on to find out more. You can see the final part of Stephen Fry's journey next Tuesday at 9 here on BBC Two.